have looked at the continuous Fourier transform and all of its definitions and some of the theories. The important theories for us are the, uh, the convolution theory and the, uh, the linearity. Um, so now it's time for, uh, for us to uh, um, stop our, our review, perhaps. Uh, it may be that, that continuous theory of Fourier might be a review for some of you. And it's time to get into uh, Fourier transforms of uh, discretized time. Uh, just the kind of uh, uh, sample time series, spatial series that uh, that we really have uh, in seismology and in many other fields. Um, so again, we're going to go with this uh, concept of a uh, of of an even time sample. And uh, sorry, I do have to um, get the right cursor again. And, and okay, constant, the, time is the, delta so the delta t is constant. Okay, so we'll represent the continuous time, you know, the time of whatever sample, as the some integer n, that's the sample index times this constant delta t. Uh, and and let's see, I think in the seismic network, most of our stations have delta t's of uh, 0.01 seconds, you know, one hundredth of a second. Um, when I record uh, high resolution um, reflection data, I typically use a delta T of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, 100 microseconds or 0.1 millisecond. And uh, wow, what a big class you got yeah, here. Down. You're getting recorded by right, so watch out. What's the date today? Six, six. Okay. And let me sign somewhere else. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. So, um, the uh, 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 this this is a crucial simplification. Um, you know, I could probably, uh, or my mathematician colleagues could give a. A class easily on what you do with unevenly sampled series, you know, where delta t is not constant, and there's all kinds of theory about uh, uh, unevenly spaced data, um, and and you know how you decide how they're clustered or not clustered. Uh, so when we get into uh, spatial sampling, we we may have to uh, refer to some of that, but uh, we're going to start easy uh, and see what we can do with e with even uh, sampling. So uh, the highest frequency representable um, is a, uh, a series which is uh, you know one. The next sample is minus one. The next sample is one. The next sample is minus one. Right. So um, that is uh, uh, it's pretty clear that that uh, I think just by inspection that you really can't put a higher frequency than that into this sample interval. So you know at at zero n equals zero. Times delta t, we have one. At delta one times delta t, we have minus one. We have one at uh, two times delta t, and, and so forth. So uh, you know, here's a, the time series, and what I um, what I want you to realize that this is a uh, a sinusoid, which I can write down as a sh in in this Euler exponential uh, shorthand, e to the i times pi times n. So that is a, uh, uh, a you know, this Euler exponential gives you a continuous series that um, um, that is at this uh, um, a continuous series. And if you look at, at the form of this, it's i times something times n. And think about uh, uh, our say when we define the Euler uh, exponential as as a cosine plus i sine. Um, this was the pi is the omega, so now we know that uh, uh, you know n is n is t, right? And here, as I warned you, is that is that implicit assumption that uh, um, <coughs> that uh, delta that delta t is one, right? Just for simplicity, we've made delta t one here. Uh, so uh, uh, the frequency, the rotational frequency of this sinusoid is pi. Okay, there you go. Um, and 
<clears throat> another thing we can observe about this is it's clear that to get a full cycle, say from peak to peak, or from trough to trough, or from zero crossing down to zero crossing down, um, you know, to do one cycle takes two times delta t. All right. If we tried to if we tried to sample at uh, at twice the uh, the frequency, okay, what would we end up with? All right. So so you know we're going to have one delta t from peak to peak. So the first sample is one, the second sample is one, the third sample is one. It's always one. All right. And and you know here it is as a time series one 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 one. It's constant. Okay, even though this is a you know we know there's a sinusoid in here, but when we sampled it at um, um, when our sampling frequency was the same as the uh, as the sinusoidal frequency, uh, then we find that uh, instead of a sinusoid, what we have is indistinguishable from uh, uh, from a constant. You know, f of t is equal to one. It's a constant function. What's the what's the frequency then? What's this apparent frequency then that we're getting? You know what would uh, what frequency of of sinusoid gives you uh, a constant? Like a harmonic or something like that. Yeah. So so you you make you write a harmonic function uh, 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 sine omega t say or cosine omega t. What does omega have to be to, to make that function equal to one all the time? Say you're writing cosine omega t. What what omega do you need to for the for the out you know for that function to always equal one? How about how about zero? Right. If you have sine of zero, right? I mean, sorry. If you have cosine of zero, then it's always going to be equal to one. No matter what time you're at, it's always one. So so the uh, uh, what what we have here is we we tried to represent a higher frequency. You know, of of more than one cycle in in two uh, delta t's. In fact, we try to do twice as good as that. We tried to put one cycle in one delta t, and and the apparent frequency uh, is giving us an apparent frequency of zero. So instead of a frequency of pi, which we had nicely represented uh, up here, we have an apparent frequency, and pi is correct. Uh, we have an apparent frequency of zero. And um, uh, so that's uh, uh, so it's you know pi was the highest frequency we could we could represent, and now we got we try to go higher than that, and the apparent frequency wraps all the way down to zero. So that's why we call it wraparound because it actually comes you know the apparent frequency goes down somehow as we uh, as we try to uh, as we try to uh, oh, you know undersample this uh, this this high frequency wave. Okay, uh, that's kind of an aside, uh, you know, explaining what happens when you violate uh, the Nyquist criterion. Um, what we uh, what we have to keep in mind is that we have a maximum representable frequency that's given some delta t, right? So here's e to the um, e to the i pi n. That's and and pi is the maximum frequency, and that's equal to e to the i times omega max. Uh, times t, okay, and so uh, you know, given the definition that t is equal to uh, um, n times delta t, then you can break out of this that omega max, the maximum rotational frequency, is pi over delta t, okay, and we call this this maximum representable frequency. Um, we call that the Nyquist frequency. After uh, uh, I don't actually know where the mathematician Nyquist is from, but uh, um, it's probably uh, about 150 years ago that uh, that he came up with this. Maybe longer ago. Um, sometimes I write it as omega sub n. Um, and of course, if you divide by, uh, if you take omega max or omega Nyquist and you divide by two pi, so one over uh, one over two delta t, then uh, you have f max. You have a, a non-rotational frequency. So f max is one over two delta t. Uh, so, so the crucial, you know, as you already know, I'm sure, uh, the crucial concept here is that the Nyquist frequency is half of the sampling frequency, um, 
And actually, here's a place where I tell you what omega really is, and it's units relative to uh, cycles per second or hertz. OK, so uh, now we can, we can put a little more detail into the, uh, the Fourier sum. All right. And uh, so, so we had a Fourier sum you know, to get to um, uh, f of, of omega. We take uh, f at time index n, and we, <coughs> we multiply. Uh, uh, and th this, this, yeah, this notation is a little too tricky. e to the power of i times omega times t sub n. Right? t sub n is, is the, uh, the time at index n. And so that's, um, of course, that time t sub n is n times delta t. And so we have uh, f at sample index n. Uh, times e to the power of i times the frequency omega, which we still haven't said exactly, you know, how we're going to space those frequencies uh, yet, um, and then times n times delta t. So this is keeping delta t in there um, for now. Okay, we're we, we're not yet assuming that it's equal to one. That delta t is equal to one. Um, so this is now a Fourier transform to any continuous frequency omega of a discretized time series. So we're like most of the way there. You know, we have, a, we, have a, a, we can do a, a continue, it's, it's essentially a continuous Fourier transform of a discrete time series. OK. Um, now, now this, this form, this summation here, might remind you of something we covered earlier this week. Um, and that's the Z-transform. So we can connect the two concepts of the Fourier transform and the Z-transform. All right. So we have a, a pulse. We, you know, let's say, let's say, uh, um, you know, there's a huge radio blackout, and and uh, across our whole network, uh, you know, on one seismometer at one time only, we get an amplitude. Okay. So for for data, all we know is that we have this particular amplitude. Uh, at uh, at time t sub n, which is n times delta t, so whatever that is, whatever n is, whatever delta t is. Um, okay, now um, let's take its Fourier transform according to this. Uh, uh, you know, we only have one sample, right? So uh, summing over m n, the uh, the summation is is just you know one term, uh, right? So uh, all we have is e to the i omega times n times delta t. Uh, and, and look at this. Uh, of course, that is equal to e to the, you know, it's equal to the quantity e to the power of i omega delta t and take that quantity to the power n. All right. Now this is starting to look really familiar. Okay. So let's just let's just define. Okay, or let's 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 just define z. You know, z is a, is a chameleon. It, it takes on a lot of a lot of different uh, uh, definitions. And here's a, here's a very useful one. I'll I'll actually call this the Fourier definition of z, because it's, you can see it's connected to the uh, the discrete Fourier sum. <clears throat> okay, uh, so if we let z equal to be equal to e to the i omega times delta t. Okay, so all that's in the exponent. Um, then uh, uh, the pulse at uh, at t sub n is z to the power of n in the omega domain, <clears throat> in the frequency domain. So so what we have now is the the z polynomial, the z transform is now with this definition for z, it's a shorthand for the Fourier transform. Okay, so we can get f uh, of omega, and really, what you know, this definition of the Fourier transform is is omega written in terms of z. Okay, and we can get we can get the Fourier transform of f in time just by turning it into a z transform. Right. So here's the familiar z uh, transform summation. We're summing you know over all the uh, different time samples, and each time sample. Is uh, times z to the power of its uh, time index, right? Uh, sum of f 
f sub n uh, times z to the nth power. Um, so uh, uh, we're gonna, you know, here's a here's another extremely powerful tool, you know, very simple in concept. Uh, it gives you it gives you a little more, um, I think, a little more realistic grasp of of what you can do with a z transform. I mean, just calling z the unit delay operator is a little mysterious, but but here we can actually write it as something. You can, you know, this is a uh, this z here is a complex number, right? It's uh, uh, it's e to the i omega delta t. Uh, it's a it's a it's an imaginary exponent exponential, and it's a, just a complex number. All right, and and thus we now whenever we do a simple z transform, you know, which we can essentially do by inspection, right? Um, you know, we just take the uh, uh, we very simply take the uh, the time series. We identify the series com uh, uh, samples as as components of or, or yeah components of, of the uh, um, um, uh, or, or uh, yeah com um, um, components in, in the z polynomial and then um, and then we also have the the z transform at uh, you know whatever frequency omega. I mean, I'm sorry. We also have the Fourier transform at the frequency of omega. Okay, so we'll leave. You know, we're for now we're happy to leave omega as a you know uh, continuous variable in here. We haven't said exactly what omegas we'll use yet. All right. Well, well, regardless of what omega is, um, let's let's graph this this z. Now that now that we know that z is a complex number, or we can define it that way, right? Uh, z equals e to the i omega delta t, which is, of course, writing it out, uh, uh, is cosine omega delta t plus i sine omega delta t. Okay, and um, uh, notice that uh, this, uh, you know, there's no scaling here, and no matter what omega is, no matter what delta t is, uh, this is always, you know, z is always on the unit circle. In the complex z plane, so here's a, a plot of the complex z plane: real z to the right, imaginary z to the to the top, and um, you know uh, the uh, what's the you know how far away is z from the uh, origin? Uh, well, you would you would take the the cosine of omega t of omega delta t, square it, and then you would add it to the sine squared of, of omega delta t, right? So you're you're adding the the sine and the cosine squared of, of the same argument, right? And that's so the the magnitude's got to be one. Um, so uh, uh, whatever whatever z uh, whatever omega is, whatever delta t is, uh, z always lands on this unit circle. Okay, and in, and and uh, here's another thing: you can you can take z to the zeroth power. Okay, which is one. That's on the unit circle. Z to the first power. Okay, that's there. For instance, that's on the unit circle. You can take z to the nth power, some integer n, is still on the unit circle. So every one of our of our uh, of our of the components of the of the of the z um, uh, polynomial is on the unit circle. So the whole polynomial is on the on the unit circle. Okay. Um, now, now, where you know where on the unit circle is it? <clears throat> well, it turns out to be omega uh, delta t um, up from the, the you know counterclockwise from the real axis. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, and if you just you know think about uh, what the cosine gives you versus what the sine gives you, you'll you'll see that um, the real part is is the cosine, the imaginary part is the sine. Um, and uh, and so now we find out that the um, you know this is actually the phase um, is uh, is is the uh, frequency times the uh, times delta t. Okay. So uh, uh, you know, we, yeah. How do we, you know this is where we kind of got stuck on the homework yesterday. And I, I was just wondering, you know, how do we figure out like where the negative 
like it makes sense to us where zero frequency would be, and uh, you know, how do we figure out where the um, you know like negative frequency? Would be? Right. So so if if let's say uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, omega delta t is um, is minus uh, um, minus pi. Yeah, minus pi over two. Okay, so then the cosine of minus pi over two is zero. The sine of minus pi over two is minus one. So then it locates right there. Does that yeah. does that help? So it's kind of like so two pi is the entire unit circle. Exactly, so. exactly. Just you know, at two pi you come so back to if one. You have negative frequencies, it's just going to be moving. Counter it just or just moving clockwise. clockwise exactly. Okay, so it could be anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and and so so like this point here, this point here, that's that's zero frequency, that's uh, zero, that's um, that's uh, uh, that's yeah, yeah, that's that's positive three hundred and sixty, that's negative three hundred and sixty, you know, that's uh, four pi, that's negative four pi, you know, all that. Uh, we're gonna have some confusion later about this point over here. On the left side of the circle, um, that is uh, uh, it's it's the same point, but it's uh, it's minus uh, pi times one. Uh, if, if delta t is one, then it's minus pi, uh, and it's also pi. <laughs> okay, so uh, but same point. Yeah. All right, so uh, that's that's going to get confusing later. Um, Okay, so given uh, uh, now our Z transform data series, we've got three ways to describe this nth order polynomial. We've got n plus one coefficients of, of the Z polynomial. Um, being a polynomial, there are, there are n roots, or as I'll call them, zeros, okay, plus a scaling factor. Okay. So we could we could you know even if we have a if let's say let's say uh, let's say we have a millionth order polynomial, okay, uh, so that would be a time series with a million and one uh, samples. Uh, what would that be? That would be uh, um, ten thousand seconds, um, which is um, three hours. Um, so it's not even a day. You know, to get a million samples out of our out of our seismic network, um, uh, and and if we could factor that, okay, uh, and we'll look at ways to factor huge time series, we could factor it into into um, into one million um, two length time series. Okay, I'll show you the form, you know, the Z transform form of a of a root. Okay, but it's basically a two. It's a time series of length two. Okay, so we would have one million, you know, length two time series all convolved together. Okay, uh, and there'd also be a scaling factor there that would come through the convolution. Uh, but here's another way now. Okay, we also get um, we get our time series x of z evaluated at a million, how many? A million and one points around the unit circle. Okay, depending on what delta t is, uh, uh, you know, and and then uh, our, uh, our our frequency omega, right? That time series is also now a million complex numbers. A million and then one complex numbers that, that are all around the, the unit circle. Okay. What do the dots mean on that X there? Is that just showing? Oh, I, I'm just making it a, a capital X, you know, with serifs. Um, uh, so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, so the uh, uh, X of omega now is a, uh, uh, you know, here's its Z transform. Okay, which is the sum uh, uh, over all the sample indices n, x sub n times z uh, to the nth power, evaluated at z equals e to the i omega delta t, 
And so now um, we have uh, uh, sum over n, at the, the, the amplitude of the, of the sample, x sub n, times e to the i omega times delta t times n. Okay. This will be a very useful, uh, uh, and, and now you also know that's the Fourier transform. The unit delay property still works, right? If we uh, take z to the n and we multiply it by z, we get uh, instead of n times delta t, we have n plus 1 times delta t in there. So it all, it all works out, you know, a very nice way of representing the z transform. It's not the only way we have, but, um, but it's, a, it's an extremely useful way and one we'll use a lot. Okay, so so what we've done here, you know, to go back way back in uh, uh, number two lecture number, you know, lecture notes number two, uh, where I showed you the different uh, uh, domains of, of time series, um, we're going from disc discrete time to continuous frequency. Okay, so we're not quite done yet. I mean, we can't. Uh, we can write all the we can write the whole Z transform down, although. You know, if there's a if there's a million and one uh, terms, it's it's going to be it's going to take a while, longer than I want to spend anyway. Um, so uh, uh, you know, we we need to uh, well, we have some more work to do, uh, especially to decide how to sample omega before we'll we'll, we'll be done with the uh, with the the z trans with the Fourier transform from discrete time. To discrete frequency, which is on the lower right here. So a uh, uh, let's let's explore uh, this uh, uh, this problem of wraparound and, and aliasing a little bit more. I want to make sure that it's uh, very well understood, um, and um, uh, because aliasing, uh, especially in space, is a uh, a real limit. It's a real hard money limit on on. Almost everything we do uh, with seismic arrays, with um, with seismic surveying, um, uh, everything we do in photography and and uh, 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 GIS data, it's 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 a it's a pretty terrible limit uh, to bump up into. Um, to to find out that you've you've made a lot of effort to record data and there, you know, if if you're unlucky. Um, or you don't forecast the aliasing well enough, you can find that uh, the uh, uh, the phenomena you want to observe are you cannot get out of the data, okay, and you have to re-record it, um, you know, sometimes to uh, to get it better. Okay, so um, I want to make sure we understand aliasing, and it's easy to understand in terms of time, even though time aliasing never bugs us anymore. Um, I suppose, well, in, in many seismic networks, time aliasing does bug, bug us because, you know, they're sampling at a 50th of a second or, or maybe uh, in some cases even a tenth of a second. So, you know, they're, they're, they're looking, you know, they can't see anything more than five hertz. And the, and the seismograms look totally different than our seismograms, which are sampled at 100 hertz. Uh, you know, we can, look at, we can look up to 50 hertz. Um, no problem. So, um, uh, you know, the kinds of analyses that we're running on our data um, are unavailable to these seismic networks that that sample, you know, less finely. Um, and uh, so there, there, there are still uh, seismologists who are who are kind of sweating the time aliasing every day. Uh, we 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 have that less, but uh, it's still worth worrying about. Okay, so here's the continuous Fourier transform of of the time series, the continuous series, uh, not continuous series, but the continuous function x of t. Okay, and we get x of omega, and so we integrate over all time uh, x of t times this uh, Fourier uh, exponential e to the i omega t time, uh, and we're integrating over dt. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, in in uh, you know closed form equations, we're going to define sampling with this comb function. All right, so uh, uh, the comb function uh, is like this. It uses these Dirac delta functions, and we have uh, many Dirac delta functions, and we're going to sum all of them together. 
and each one is delayed by n delta t. Okay, so we have one for every sample space of delta t that we want to make, one uh, uh, one direct delta function. You put them all together, and it looks like a cone. Okay, we'll call that c of t. All right, and there's uh, how we're setting it up. Uh, and so the um, uh, the sampled version, right? So we have here's the the continuous Fourier transform. This is entirely correct. There's nothing lost here of this continuous time series. Here is the continuous Fourier transform that's estimated, right? Because the cone function c is multiplied by the by the uh, uh, our input function x before we do the Fourier transform. Okay. So to get the sample data, we, we multiply c of t by x of t, right? So that gives us our discretely sampled uh, data through the use of this comb function, okay? Uh, and then and then we do you know the Fourier integral uh, with the Fourier exponential, and and now so what we have is not exactly x, well you know it's an estimate of of, of x of omega. We'll call it x hat, okay? So we get the instead of the the original Instead of being the Fourier transform of the original x input, it's the Fourier transform of the sampled x input. So it's an estimate of x. Um, well, OK, the convolution theorem tells us that if we do a multiplication in the time domain, we can represent that as a convolution in the, uh, in the frequency domain. All right? So, so the now what we see is the um, um, <clears throat> uh, the the this x hat this estimate of the Fourier transform of the time series is the convolution of the okay capital C of omega is the Fourier transform of the comb function convolved with the uh, uh, capital X which is the Fourier transform of the input function x. X of t, okay. So if we just if we could figure out what the Fourier transform of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the comb function is, then we can get some insight as to how you know how close is is x hat to the the x hat the x that we want of omega, okay. How close are those? Um, and I, I I don't think I'm going to prove it later, but um, the uh, Fourier transform of the comb function. Uh, in time is is another comb function. It looks like this. It's a it's a sum of a whole bunch of Dirac delta functions, and it's a delta function you know on the omega axis, um, and uh, it's at uh, it's it's uh, shifted. You know the frequency of the of the spike is shifted from zero by two pi n over delta t. Okay, so at um, at zero frequency there's a spike. At two pi uh, n over delta t, there's a spike, and and so forth. All right. Um, notice that. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, you know the comb function is um, uh, in time was very closely spaced, right? It's a very fine tooth comb, right? There's a, a, a comb tine every. Uh, uh, every delta t, right? Very finely spaced. Uh, does it make some sense to you that? Um, and, and you could make a comb function in. Uh, uh, you could make a comb function in, in. Uh, uh, FFT lab, okay, and then see what it transforms to. That's, I, I mean, okay, I, I could do all the algebra, and I still wouldn't understand it, okay. My the, the understanding of these things that I come to comes through tools like like FFT Lab and playing around with them. So I hope it's working that way for you, uh, despite the frustrations with the the uh, inadequate square function that I added. Oh, yeah. um, as soon as you left Tyler, managed to get it. Oh really? Yeah. Let's go. So so <laughs> just tell me tell me what you did, and that's fine. I you okay. know you know I, I know I know it's an inadequate square function that I added. It it, it doesn't properly re Re, you know, reset the amplitude of the of the of the spikes, so it's there, but you can't see it. Okay, so um, uh, the uh, uh, 
um, I hope it makes sense that, that you have a fine tooth comb in time, and that Fourier transforms to actually a very gap tooth, very wide comb in, uh, in frequency. So uh, uh, you know these these uh, uh, these uh, uh, tines are very far apart. You know two pi. Uh, you know if we if delta t is one, right? Two pi n is actually is actually all the way around the unit circle. Okay, so the tines are separated by the whole you know unit circle, but we're you know we're looking at a at a frequency axis here. Um, Okay, so so let's let's assume some amplitude spectrum uh, of a uh, um, of of an input x. Okay, so here is um, you know, and, and it's of course it's going to be way more complicated than this, but I'm just using this this half circle, you know, to represent a uh, a spectrum. Of a uh, of a wave, and notice it's on the negative frequency; it's on the positive frequency. That's one thing we have to get used to. This is all cyclic, and uh, it's as it's, we could we could use positive frequencies from from zero to, to two pi, uh, but we don't. We actually use positive frequencies from zero to pi, and we also use the negative frequencies from zero down to minus pi. So this constant, you know, you're going to be very familiar with this concept of negative frequency. Um, uh, soon enough. So uh, uh, you know the full spectrum we have to represent between uh, you know at negative frequencies and at positive frequencies. Okay. So the uh, uh, this this input time series x you know transforms to a uh, uh, you know some some and I'm, I'm essentially plotting an amplitude spectrum here. Uh, I could plot a power spectrum also. Um, you know, it's something that uh, uh, can do anything, uh, but only within up to a certain omega maximum. And, and I, I'm also implying that it only goes down to a certain minus omega max. Okay, so it only ever gets you know so far from zero frequency, and then. You know, at, at higher than plus omega max or lower frequencies than not lower but more negative frequencies than than minus omega max, there's nothing. There's no energy. Okay, and, and of course this is a in a way this is a, a gross assumption because you know there are um, you know affecting your your uh, geophone. There are there are gamma rays shooting through it that are adding. Um, um, that are adding energy in the in the you know to the adding energy to the signal in the, at the petahertz. Okay, so uh, uh, you know there there's all there's never nothing beyond omega max. But but this is kind of a red flag for us saying okay we you know we're gonna have to be really careful to to do everything we can to make sure that our that our data. Have a, an omega max, and we know what it is, okay, and we handle it. All right. Is that usually based on the sampling rate, just like based on your limitations of what you can actually see? Anyway? Yeah, yeah. So we'll 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 it, well actually here's the the definition right down here. Okay. So 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 here's here's what we want to end up with, right? We have uh, our our estimate of um, of uh, of the the Fourier transform of X. Which is basically the convolution of the Fourier transform of the comb function with the Fourier transform of the um, um, of x, the input, right? So here's the Fourier transform of the input. It's this half circle. Here's the Fourier transform of c, the comb function, right? So you convolve a half circle with a spike. You get a copy of the half circle. Okay. And and where are those half circles located? Well, they're located at minus two pi over delta t. They're located at zero. They're located at two pi over delta t. All right. And and what we have here is uh, and it's all cyclic, right? We're just winding around the around and around the uh, unit circle. Okay. So so we got you know we got a we got a 
you know, on this frequency axis, right, it, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, you know, we got we got infinite copies of this uh, uh, of this comb function uh, Fourier transform, which means we're gonna after convolution we've got infinite copies of our input spectrum or our input Fourier transform. And 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 let's look at the you know this part here, which is between minus pi over delta t and pi over delta t, right? That's that's 2 pi in frequency. That's 1 times the, around the unit circle. So we call that the principal fold. It contains the zero frequency. Okay, That's the principal fold. And, uh, uh, and if we hold to the Nyquist criterion down here, then these circles will not touch. Right? If the circles touch, right? if omega max is, is too large, then the... Uh, uh, then they're going to add together, and we're going to get some kind of artifact, right? The the uh, you know the Fourier transform of of this part is going to interfere in the Fourier transform of this one. They're going to add together. We're going to get some sort of, some sort of artifact. It's not going to be right. That's going to be a, a difference between um, between x hat and the real x we want. Okay. And we're only, you know, we're mainly concerned. Well, okay, what's happening here on the principal fold between minus pi and pi? And I still got delta t in here for uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so, so the the Fourier transforms of the input will not overlap, and will be just fine so long as the Nyquist criterion is true. Okay, the absolute value of omega max is less than pi over delta t. All right. And that, of course, is the simple Nyquist criterion you know. But now you know exactly what happens when you go beyond the Nyquist criterion. And, and OK, there are those seismic networks that, that, that are fighting the Nyquist criterion in time. We don't do that. We don't have to fight it so much in, in, um, in, uh, um, in exploration. But um, uh, spatial Nyquist criteria are dogging us all the time. Okay, we are we are thinking ah, you know, it's gonna take me a million extra dollars, or with some modern surveys, maybe fifty million dollars, you know, to, to lower the Nyquist, you know, to, to to raise the Nyquist criterion up to up to sufficient spatial frequency, um, and so it becomes a real, you know, it's a real economic calculation you have to make, you know. And if there is some essential way that you have got to get, and you're not going to get it unless you spend the money and 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 raise that Nyquist criterion, then you know you you have to, you know, your boss is not going to is not going to shell out an extra fifty million for no reason. You've got to present a a, a real solid business case for that. Okay, so here's what happens when when those um, when those overlap, right? If um, okay, we just saw if if absolute value of omega max is less than pi over delta t, there's no overlap, and in the principal fold, you know minus pi to pi frequency, um, x hat is equal to x. Okay, and we're perfect. We're good. No no problem. The sampling is perfect. It is a it is a perfectly adequate representation. If omega max is great, absolute value of omega max is greater than there's any, any you know any energy at any of those higher frequencies. Okay, then it's greater than uh, uh, pi over delta t, and these are overlapping. And then if we just look in the principal fold, we're going to see something like this, right? And here's again, it's why it's called wraparound, right? Because the the negative frequency part is is pushing you know down in frequency here. You know, if we look at the, the positive frequencies, okay, it's it's pushing down, so it's it's adding to lower frequencies than we expected. It's it's you know this is a high negative frequency and it's adding to a lower frequency, so that's that's why it's wraparound. Principal, I should say principal fold, okay, misspelled, um, and and. and uh, the only way to overcome aliasing is is more samples. Okay, um, 
so, so for instance, in my Remy work, I am able to go beyond the spatial aliasing because, to a certain extent, because I have more than two seismograms. Okay, my seismic array has more than two elements. Um, so I can do something. You know, I can still pull something out beyond the first Nyquist. Okay, um, I can't do anything above uh, above Tyson Nyquist. I can't do anything above the cycling frequency itself, which makes sense. Um, but uh, uh, you know, if if you have one seismogram and you have time aliasing, then there is nothing you can do. You can't process it out later. You can't filter it out. It's there. You might be able to recognize it if you're lucky, um, but you can't get rid of it. Okay. You have to record the data again, digitize the data again. Um, most modern exploration instruments, at least I'm familiar with, uh, they've given up on using um, you know, hardware anti-alias filters you know, built out of coils and capacitors and, and uh, resistors because those are just too hard to calibrate and keep working right. You know, they, their properties change depending on the temperature, and so it just doesn't work. Um, you, know, you can use active filters still. Very, you know, too, hard, you know, too expensive to build. Um, you know, everything, everything, electronics now, they're not based on, on calibrated components. They're based on, on cheap, um, uncalibrated components, but an accurate clock. So as long as the crystal clock is accurate, then everything else works. So, so how, the, how the modern instrument makers exploit that is uh, you may tell the seismograph, uh, Bison actually doesn't do this, but the more modern ones do. You may tell the seismograph you want, um, um, you want uh, a sample every millisecond. It's going to take a sample every, um, um, Every uh, uh, every hundredth of a millisecond, it's going to average those hundred samples together, and then give you what you asked for. So it's trying, you know, it's it's oversampling uh, uh, as it's digitizing the data to get around that. Okay, and that's a that's a fair strategy. Um, what uh, um, what I have often found is is uh, is that the people who own these instruments then they they tend to uh, um, uh, they they tend to keep all the data you know right down to the hundredth of a millisecond, and so their their data files are just way too large you know compared to what they should be, but that's going to be less of a problem too. Uh, let's say we we actually have omega max equal to uh, the sampling frequency right two pi over delta t, all right. Um, so uh, then we have like total overlap here right. So uh, this is where you know, we, we put that that uh, uh, spike if, a couple pages back. We put that spike at uh, at frequency omega, and and uh, that wrapped all the way back to um, uh, that wrapped all the way back to zero frequency and gave us a constant function. And that's what's happening here. You know, here's our principal fold, and then here's the Nyquist. Uh, you know, from uh, the fold above and the fold below. You know they're both they're both adding into uh, zero frequency, so total wraparound there. Um, okay, so um, um, if omega max is uh, uh, less than pi over delta t, then here's our Nyquist criteria: our the maximum frequency we get is one over two delta t hertz. Um, also spatial. Oh, okay. The minimum wavelength, or, or really I should call this period here, since it's a time wavelength, is uh, greater than 2 times delta t. Okay? So what what's this, this is saying is we've got to sample at two or more points on our highest frequency wavelengths. All right. Um,